Amen. Well, good morning. We're glad you're here. We're so grateful that you're watching online, and we want to welcome you into the room. And we want you to send in your suggestions of what we should paint on Brandon's face. So uh, during the barbecue, if you got any good ideas of what Brandon should have, put them in the chat as you're watching or uh, send them to us or tell us after uh, the service. We're really excited about the barbecues and looking forward to just spending some time together and getting to meet people. Now, my guess is when you get up in the morning, you prepare for the day. And one of the ways we prepare for the day is by dressing up or putting on what it is that we need to be ready for the day. If you're a police officer, you put on what? Kevlar. If you're a chef, you put on what? An apron. If you are a uh, construction worker or a carpenter, you put on a tool belt. If you are a firefighter, you put on your fire retardant gear that we dress up to prepare for the day. So let me ask you, are you prepared for everything today? All right, wow. Are you prepared for what God can do, and are you prepared against the battle of the enemy? Because what Paul here is going to remind us, he's going to pull back the curtain between our natural world and the spiritual world, and he's going to remind us that you and I have an enemy. And I know sometimes we want to come to Jesus, we want to have a nice life, a nice home, nice family, nice quiet life. But for the next few weeks, Paul the Apostle is going to remind us we are in a battle. We are living life in the arena. That there is an enemy who wants to take us out. He wants to take our kids out. He wants to wipe out the next generation. He wants to make the name of Jesus not heard. He wants to destroy churches. He wants to discourage us. And he wants you and I to live absolutely defeated spiritual lives. But what we want to see today as we open up this series is that when we feel we are defeated, that God wants us to stand strong. And in this introductory message, we're going to see that standing strong comes from knowing our enemy and understanding his tactics. In the weeks following, we're going to look at some other ways to stand strong. But that we have an enemy, Paul says you need to know him and you need to understand his tactics because he wants us to stand. Not defeated, not discouraged, not living a weak life, but understanding our victory in Jesus. So I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. If you have your mobile device, you can follow along on screen. Uh, Open up your Bible. If you're watching from home, get your Bible out. Get ready to mark it up. And and Paul here is writing to the church in Ephesus. And Ephesus is one of the largest churches or one of the largest cities in the ancient world at the time. It was a very spiritual place. They worshipped this goddess Diana. They believed that a statue of Diana that was in the center of the city just kind of fell from the sky. That Diana just chose this city. That they worshipped her with all sorts of spiritual practices. In the center of the city was also one of the biggest libraries in the ancient world. In that library house, a lot of books on magic and incantation, sorcery, and the like. And one of the first things we read in the book of Acts when Paul enters into Ephesus is that he casts out some demons from this guy. And Paul here is going to talk about the spiritual world. We don't talk about it a lot in our culture. We're too scientific, so to speak. We're too natural. We're going to see that the Ephesians were very aware of a spiritual world. They didn't question it. They didn't go, Paul, what are you talking about? Like, this is craziness. They understood it. Because they knew in order to stand, they needed to understand who their real enemy was and what his tactics were. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So therefore, I want you to take up the whole, not part, But the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand and withstand in the evil day. And having done all, I want you to what? Stand firm. Stand, therefore, 
having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit that is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and all supplication. And what we see here is the word Paul repeats again and again and again is what? Stand. That when we feel defeated, discouraged, weak, when we feel broken, Paul says, I want you to stand firm. And he says, I want you to know how to do it. He begins in verse 10 with this word, finally. The word finally there doesn't mean, oh, I've run out of time or I better close up my letter. The word finally, it really means like in the final days, in the final moments, I want you to live suited up. I want you ready for battle to realize we have an enemy and understand his schemes so you can put on the armor. And I've spent more time in this passage over the last few months. I've never right dug into this passage as much as we're going to dig into and look at what does it mean every day to put on the armor and to get ready. And I appreciate our, our life group, the life group we've been part of for the last five or six months, we've been in this passage and that helping me, how do we really live this out? And as we introduce the message series today, we're reminded we need to know what our true enemy. Paul says that, I want you to know your true enemy. He says what? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But we wrestle against rulers and powers and authorities. And when you read that, you think, well, wait a minute, Paul. He's in prison. He's chained 24-7 to a guard. He has someone standing ready for battle right next to him. And, and you know, if you read the Apostle Paul's life, he had a lot of difficulties with people and others. And you could easily say, Paul wrestled a lot with flesh and blood, but he said, behind that, there's a greater reality. There's something probably even more real. And oftentimes, what do we do? We blame people. We blame situations. Right? And most of us here, maybe you're wrestling with the spouse. Maybe it's a wrestle with your kids. Maybe it's a wrestle with a family member. Maybe it's a wrestle at work. Maybe it's your neighborhood. Maybe it's a friendship. Maybe there's something and there's this wrestling and this tug of war and this frustration and confusion and anger and anxiety. And Paul says, hey, remember that behind that, there is this spiritual reality that you have an enemy who wants to take you out. And Paul here reminds us of something that we often forget, that we are part of this natural world, but we're also part of a spiritual reality. That there is a spiritual world that God has also created. We read a bit about that in the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Paul is writing about this. He says, for by him, Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and in earth. God created this. Christ was part of God's creation, but he not only created things here, but he created things in the heavenly realms, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. And Paul here reminds us that before God created this planet, that God created a spiritual reality. And that he created what we would call as the angelic realm. God and three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit always existed. But at some point he created the spiritual angelic realm. That they are called what we call holy angels. That the word angel, angelos in, in Greek just means messenger. That they do God's bidding. That they serve on his behalf. That they worship him. That they are there to bring glory to God. And that these were created beings. There was a time in history when they are created. We don't think that God keeps creating angels or adds to them. Uh, sometimes what people think is, oh, when a loved one dies, they've now got their wings. They're an angel. That's not what happens. We don't become an angel. We become a resurrected self. We are who we are, but even more alive. That these angels don't get added in creation, but they are limited in their person, they're limited in their power, they're limited in their ability, they're limited in their knowledge, they're limited in time and space, they can't be everywhere at once like God is. 
And the book of Isaiah and the book of Ezekiel tell us that of those marshaled ranks of angels, that there was one who seemed to be over many. His name was Lucifer. And that Lucifer seemed to have authority over many of the angels. We understand Paul says here, right, there's thrones and powers and rulers that somehow the, the angels are kind of, as we would describe, in a military rank. And that Lucifer was one of the most powerful of angels. Sometimes people assume that maybe he was the chief worshiper. And at some point in the past, Lucifer had had enough of worshiping God. And he starts this rebellion, this mutiny in heaven. We read about it in Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 12, it says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you once, who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I'm going to raise my throne above the stars of God. I'll sit enthroned in the amount of the assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I'll make myself like the Most High, but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depth of the pit. And Isaiah pulls back the curtain, and we get to see what one time happened in heaven where Lucifer, this chief angel, got kind of into himself, and notice the sin of pride. Five times, it's, he says what? I will. I am going to do something. I'm going to raise my profile. I'm going to sit on the throne. I'm going to sit on the enthroned of the Most High, which many commentators believe was the place set for Jesus. I am going to rise above the clouds, and I will what? I will be like God. Do you remember what the temptation to Eve in the Garden of Eden was? When Satan comes to her, he says what? If you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. And that's the lie. That we can somehow become God. Not that God fills us or indwells us or become like him, but that we will be him. And so God, because of Satan's pride, because of his arrogance, cast him out of heaven. And we read in the book of Revelation that there were maybe about a third of the angels that followed him. A third of the angels that said, hey, we're going to join Satan. We've had enough of God. And we read about that in Revelation 12, verse 3. It says, then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. And you get this picture that Satan, this kind of red dragon, when he was expelled from heaven, that he took a third of the angels. And so what theologians and, and biblical scholars say is that today, two-thirds of those created angels, they are what we would call holy angels. They are with God. They are messengers of God. They work with God. They support God. The Bible talks about the fact that we have a guardian angel. The Bible says that when we pass from this life to the next, we're kind of ushered in if through the, the presence and the guidance of an angel. But one-third are fallen angels. And we would call those perhaps demons. That's kind of the New Testament term, that they are anti-God, they're anti the work of God, they're trying to get people distracted and distorted and discouraged in their relationship with God. Now, we have to remember that these are created beings. Sometimes what we think is that, oh, there is God who is almighty and powerful, and there is Satan who is almighty and all-powerful. They're just on opposing teams, and you get to choose what team. That's not what it is. There is God. There is one God, one deity. Satan's created. And Satan does not have all knowledge. Satan does not have the ability to be everywhere at the same time. Satan does not even have all power. He has some power, but not all powerful. And that somehow... God still allows Satan and his troops to work. And Paul here says that our, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities 
and forces, you get the sense that in these fallen angels, there are ranks. There are maybe some fallen angels who uh, control certain geographic areas, some who maybe uh, are experts in certain sins, that Satan doesn't know everything. He doesn't know everything. And most of us probably never deal with Satan himself in our life, but maybe one of these fallen angels. And for some reason, God at this point has allowed Satan to have some power and some reign. Satan is ultimately defeated. There will be a moment when he is ultimately defeated. And we read about that in Revelation 20, verse 10. It says, and the devil who deceived them, this is speaking about the future, the end of this age, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and false prophet have been thrown and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. There is a punishment, a confinement, a, a time where Satan and all his demonic followers will be. They will be completely kind of contained, imprisoned. Satan was defeated at the cross, right? He's lost the keys to death. He's lost the power over us. Jesus showed that he is greater, but he still has some influence. And God, for whatever reason, allows that influence. He tempted Eve in the garden. He tempted Jesus in the wilderness. The night before he was crucified, Jesus said to Peter, Satan's asked to sift you. And that Satan and his demonic realms have the opportunity to influence people. Now, many times we wish, right, why would God do that? And I think one of the first questions my kids asked was like, why would God do that? Why would God just not kick Satan out? It's because God wants to give us a chance, I guess, to exert our free will, to choose him. He doesn't want us to be automatrons that have to worship him, have to follow him. He wants us to have our free choice and free will to choose him. And that's what real love is when you choose to love someone but there will be a time when he's defeated. And friends, I think a lot of times one of the enemy's kind of tactics is to kind of make us not aware that we're in an arena, that we have an enemy. And a number of years ago, it was a Sunday evening, I got a phone call, a frantic phone call from a brother in this family. And they said, could you come to our house? Like our sister is freaking out. She's writhing on the floor. We don't know what to do. She's mumbling things. We, we don't know what we can do for her. And, and so I kind of got suited up. I thought, oh boy, I don't know what I'm going to get into. They don't really teach you in seminary what happens when you have kind of a demonic encounter. Fortunately, I've had a few others before. And uh, I went to their house, and this was a very quiet, shy young woman. And when I got to the house, the brother met me at the door, ushered me up to the parents' master bedroom, and she was on the floor. The rest of the family was kind of kneeling around her. They were singing hymns. They didn't even know what to do. And she was speaking madness. And I went to talk to her and, and say hello. And she, she was very sweet, like you could hardly hear her in normal conversation, with this deep, growling voice started yelling at me, telling me I had no right to be there and calling me unspeakable names that no human being had ever called me before. And I got quite upset. I was like, no one calls me that. You can't call me that. And I can tell you, for hours she had been there. Within a few minutes, I'm just like, no, what's the truth? The truth that this young woman has been bought with a price. She's accepted Jesus. She was dedicated by her parents. Oh, no, she's not. She's ours, these voices would say. And I would say, you have to get out. And they would say, no, we have a right to be here. And I was like, who's your leader? Because Paul says, right, there's different ranks. And you have to kind of, weirdly enough, work yourself up to the rank. Who's the leader? And I said, you have no right to be here. You have to be out. And in an instant, that prayer was answered. And that person was free. And friends, we forget we're in an arena. This young woman had really opened herself up. She read a lot of occultic kind of books and, and literature and kind of filled her mind with a lot of dark things. 
And she had filled her mind with that and become consumed, and it was a doorway. And Paul says, you and I, we have an enemy. And that enemy has schemes. And the second thing he says, I want you to know the schemes, the tactics. And Paul here reminds us that Jesus right, is, is able to be greater because we got the armor, but the enemy has some tactics. And when I was pastoring in St. Louis, one of our staff was also a chaplain to the St. Louis Rams before they moved to uh, California. And sometimes we would have small meetings we'd use kind of just an office or a conference room in the Rams training center. And you go there and on the blackboards are all these patterns, all these tactics that the team is gonna use to try to win a game. And in other places, there's all these tactics that the opposing team, they were studying, what's the opposing team gonna do? What's their normal plays? How do they understand that? They're trying to guess their plays so that they can beat them. And, And the Rams said, the more we know about the tactics of the opposing team, the more we're able to be victorious. And Paul here says the same thing, that I want you to know his schemes. And the enemy, Satan, is not very creative. Actually, he's only got a handful of tactics, but he just uses them again and again and again. And his first tactic is that of temptation. And we see that's what Satan did in the garden with Eve. He tempted her. He took Jesus into the wilderness and tempted him. And in fact, in the wilderness, in Matthew 4, verse 3, it says, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the son of God, command these stones to be loaves of bread. He starts tempting Jesus. And notice it doesn't say Satan or the devil or Lucifer. It calls him what? The tempter. That that's his scheme. And that he loves to tempt us. There's an old, old book. It was written in the 1600s by Thomas Brooks. It's called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And he talks about some of Satan's tempting tactics. He says one of the things the enemy does in temptation is that he shows us the bait, but he hides the hook, right? And we look like a fish, right? Sees the bait, oh, that's good, that's gonna be good, and hides how destructive that is. And so, you know, sometimes, like, you're so full of, right? You're so angry, you think, I just wanna say it, I wanna call them that, I wanna lash out. I I, I wanna hit, I wanna do something, I wanna just show my anger. I know I'm gonna feel so much better if I could just let it out. And you let it out, and what happens? Immediately you realize what you've done, and immediately you see the hook, and you think, I messed up. Or you have this juicy piece of gossip, and you just want someone else to know, you know you're gonna feel so good if I could just share it, I will feel good. I I know that I'll look better because I know have this insider information. I'm gonna make them look better. And the minute you spew that piece of gossip, what happened? Oh, you realize it's got a hook. You not only hurt them, but you probably hurt your reputation. Satan shows us the bait and hides the hook. Sometimes what he does is that he compartmentalizes our life, right? That, so we look really good in some areas, and because we're really good in some areas, we think, oh, I can excuse something else. You watch the movies or the TV show, you know, about these mafia families, right? And you look at them, and what happened all the time? They have these great families. Their kids love them. They always have dinner together, meals together. They're very tight. Family's like, oh, look, I'm a wonderful dad, so I can go kill a few people. It's somehow okay to kill a few people because you're great. And and sometimes that's what we do. It's like, well, look at my life. Look how I honor God this way. It's like this release, it's okay. It's not going to hurt people. Temptation. Second tactic is deception, that he loves to lie and deceive. John 8, 44 says, you, Jesus speaking, are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. 
He, talking about the devil, was a murderer from the beginning and doesn't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. One translation says when he, spe when he speaks, he lies because that's his native tongue. That's all he knows how to speak is a lie. It's deception. And he loves to do that. Often the battle is in our minds. We're going to see this in a few weeks, that the implanted lies... A lie that's believed as truth in our life affects us as if it were truth, right? A lie that we believe, oh, that's got to be true, will affect us as much as the truth does. And there's like, oh, God doesn't care. God doesn't love you. God just wants you happy, right? Not holy. He just wants you happy. God will understand. This will happen. He, the enemy loves to lie. Usually the lies, it's 98% truth, but just 2% a little twist. That's why it's important to know the truth. The third tactic that he loves to do, often again in our mind, is just condemnation. Right? He accuses us, makes us feel bad. What temptation does is make, oh, God's not really going to care that much. I can do what I want. What condemnation does is that, oh, God is so holy, and look who, how terrible I am. I just could never come to God. God could never love me. We see this in Revelation 12, verse 10. Uh, the book of Revelation says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven, says, Now the salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For notice what, the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. He doesn't call him Satan. What does he call him? The accuser. And he loves to accuse us. And we see this in the book of Job. That Job uh, was a righteous man. He loved God. And as Satan kind of goes to God and says, hey, you know that Job guy? Like, uh, yeah, he loves to go to church and worship you, but he only does it because you give him nice things. If he didn't have nice things, he wouldn't wor worship you. And Satan's always accusing. He's showing your sin, not the Savior. He's always making you look at how big and great your sin is, not how great Jesus is. He accuses us by making us think, oh, every bad thing, every hard thing in our life, oh, that must be punishment. I must have messed up. God's really mad at me. God's punishing for me. A lot of things happen in our life are not punishment from God. That he loves to accuse us and make you think, oh, you're the only one who deals with, you're the only one. I don't know how many people I've talked to thought they're the absolute worst sinner. You, you know, God could never forgive. We're all messed up and sinful. He loves to make us think, oh, it's just us. Or we're the only ones that struggle with that. We all do. One other one of his tactics is confusion. Right? He loves to confuse us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23, it says, For God is not what? A God of confusion. He's a God of peace. So who's the God of confusion? The enemy. And what the enemy loves to do, loves to get us angry at each other, divided, frustrated, resentment, hurt. I'm, I can't believe that that person would do, and, and love to do that and divide us. And sometimes that confusion, it comes in anxiety, right? We're worried, oh, what's going to happen? I don't know. Is God with me? Is, not, is God going to help me? Is he not? Is this going to have a good ending or is it not? And, and we live in a lot of confusion and the enemy loves to stir things up, stir people up. He certainly loves to stir churches up. Sometimes that confusion comes uh, out of our identity. Like, who am I? And we live in a world, right, where uh, our younger generation, right, there's so much confusion. What's it mean to be made in God's image? Right, if we only understood how God created us, there'd be so much less confusion. And the last tactic is that Satan loves to isolate us. 
loves to separate us, make us feel far from God and far from other people. Often he does that through fiery darts. He kind of lobs these things. He loves distraction. He loves to distort God. He, he loves to bring discouragement, right? All of a sudden you're, you're doing well, everything seems okay, and then this thing comes and it keeps hitting you again and again and again, and, and it just keeps you from God or keeps you from other people because Satan knows if he can isolate you, he's got you. And so Paul says, know the enemy, know the tactics so that you can prepare. And for the next few weeks, we're going to look at each piece of armor because they're the design to help us with these tactics. When you have these fiery darts of discouragement and confusion, you need what? A shield of faith that's going to be able to stop every one of them. When you are tempted, you need what? The sword of the spirit, Paul says, which is the word of God. You need the truth of God's word to help you. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, what helped him overcome temptation? He spoke the word of God. That we need a breastplate of righteousness when Satan accuses us and condemns us and says, look at who you are. We say, no, 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 wait a minute. Christ, I'm hidden in Christ. I'm wearing the breastplate of righteousness, which is Christ. That we have a helmet of salvation to help us understand who we are in Christ. That when there's confusion and we're not at peace, we might have the shoes of the gospel of peace that helps us bring peace in relationships, bring peace in God. Because Paul says here, we don't stand firm in our own effort or ability. We stand firm in Christ. And so I want to invite Mike and Mary Ann Bodding. They are two of our missionaries in Uganda. They're here this weekend. And they've experienced some spiritual warfare in their work in Africa. Mike and Mary Ann are missionaries that Baby supports in Uganda. They work with Emmanuel International and they work at Developing Leaders. Would you welcome them here at Bayview? And uh, you'll get to speak to them at the end. They've got uh, a table out in the lobby. And Mike and Marianne, would you tell us a little bit about where you are located in Uganda? Where's your ministry there? Yes, thanks, Pastor Terry. We're up in the north. Um, we ourselves live in a city called Gulu, but the base of operations is in a rural town called Pade, the middle pin on the map there. And then the other two pins are places where we are either partnering or exploring partnerships among lesser reached people groups. And so as you've been there, you've been there for a number of years. Can you describe what your day-to-day -day ministry and work is like? So when we first went in 2012, uh, Uganda was really still recovering from many years of insurgency with the Lord's Resistance Army. And we were invited by our church partner to help them implement a ministry called Community Health Empowerment, uh, which is seeking to transform communities through community health, through agriculture, and also through the gospel. And after three years, we were handing that over to our church partner leadership and praying and trying to discern what God wanted for us next. And uh, through a house fire, God led us into discipleship ministries and missions mobilization. So we work with churches to help them be more effective in their ministries, whether that's training Sunday school teachers or uh, doing school outreaches, um, Bible study groups, um, church leadership trainings, or whether it's working with the church to grasp the vision for missions so that they can also identify, equip, and send missionaries. And it's important to say that we don't do this by ourselves, but we do do this with churches and with a really wonderful Ugandan missionary missions team. I love that, the, the idea of raising up local leaders and Ugandan missionaries and leaders. Now, we talk here about spiritual warfare in Canada, spiritual warfare in Uganda. How is it different and what have you seen in Uganda? So, yeah, living in Uganda has definitely made us more aware of spiritual warfare. Um, but, of course, the enemy is just as active in Canada as he is in other parts of the world. But we've come to realize that he uses different strategies because people ha come from different worldviews. Um, so in Canada, um, our observation is uh, he likes to convince people that he doesn't exist. 
perhaps because most Canadians have adopted more of a scientific, rational worldview. Everything has a physical cause, a, a rational explanation. Um, but in Uganda, people come from an animistic background where most people perceive that almost everything has a spiritual cause behind it. So for Satan to lay down and, and act uh, like a dead dog wouldn't work very well there. So instead, he tries to make himself look more powerful and to rule through fear and intimidation. And as a result, uh, we see things like you described in your story a lot more frequently. Uh, I had never seen anything like that in Canada before I went. Then in the frontier places where the gospel is kind of breaking new ground into an area that's been controlled by the enemy for a long time, there, there can ev be even more of these power clashes where the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness are coming against each other and God is just announcing who he is through miracles and healings and validating the message of the messengers. I think sometimes that's when people go on mission trips, right? They see those power encounters. That's what they get so excited. They see God at work. I know you shared, Michael, about a, a real live experience of spiritual warfare you've seen again and again. Yeah, so one of the ministries that we're involved in is training rural uh, church volunteers how to follow up with new believers and how to do discipleship. And so we'll go and show the Jesus film in their community with the idea that within 48 hours, those volunteers are following up with the new believers and starting a Bible study for them to all grow in faith together. And no ministry has as much spiritual warfare, overt spiritual warfare, than the Jesus film ministry. Whether it's vehicles breaking down, equipment suddenly stopping working, uh, you know, community opposition, weather changes, We've seen so many things, but the biggest one was when we first started, we had a lot of examples of demon possession, just like out of the New Testament. You know, we would be showing the Jesus film, and then all of a sudden, someone would start shouting and screaming and throwing themselves around. And interestingly, it was usually when in the Jesus film, they were showing Jesus performing a miracle. And what we did at first was we would stop the movie, and we would pray for that person, and then we would try to keep going. But what we eventually realized, and actually Pastor Steve Irvin, who was the pastor here, helped us understand that what Satan was doing was he was trying to distract. He was trying to stop the film. He was trying to stop people from hearing the gospel message. And when we realized that, what we started doing was praying much more intentionally before and during the film, and then also having a team to take those people away to pray for them separately so that the film could keep on going and people could see that message. And when we did that, we found that those incidents greatly reduced. Mm -hmm. And that is the enemy loves to distract and, and get us off focus. How have you learned to combat spiritual warfare? How in the, in the arena that you are in, how do you battle? I think for me, the biggest thing is not to be afraid, but to pray. You know, God makes us aware of spiritual warfare, not so that we'll be afraid, but so that we'll pray, we'll depend on him, and when he gets the victory, we'll give him the glory. And he will have the victory because he's the name above every name. And I think Satan desires the opposite. He desires that our awareness of spiritual warfare will create fear, and fear will paralyze us. So don't be afraid, pray. And when you pray, you pray scripture like Jesus did. Uh, it is the sword of the spirit. Satan comes at us with lies, and this is why it's so important to be immersed in the word. When those lies are come to be planted in you, do they have a place to take root? If you're full of truth, there's less opportunity. Then when he has to stand further away from you and shoot the darts, do you have the truths in your heart and on your mind to be able to come against those lies. And just the last thing that I would say as well is if you're married or if you have children, Satan often attacks indirectly by attacking our marriages and attacking our children. And we've had a lot of examples of that through the years. And we always pray for our family every night and we'd really encourage that. Don't just pray for yourself for covering, but pay, pray for your marriage, pray for your children. It obviously works. We're still married. <laughs>
Well, one of the things we want to do is just to help everyone with some of those strategies as we look on putting the armor. So uh, we have a, a text number. If you could text armor to this number, there's a QR code. It'll take you there uh, as well. And what this will do is we'll send you a daily text just to remind us that we're in the arena and how to be able to kind of do that. It's a reminder every day that, that there is a battle and what the truths of God's word and how to be able to do that. So we would love for you to be able to text though that and receive those texts and we can kind of be strong together. And I know you've got a couple other really good stories uh, to share and uh, we'll be able to hear those on our weekend Wednesday podcast. So it comes out every Wednesday. You can find the link in our newsletter. And I know you're our guest on that podcast this Wednesday, just sharing some more stories and strategies uh, of what you've done. Uh, so I just uh, invite us to pray. The worship team is going to come back and invite us just to celebrate uh, the victory of Christ. And I want to pray for Mike and Marianne and encourage you to say hello to them in the lobby. Lord, thank you for uh, this couple who has given up their life to serve you uh, in a very different place and to raise up leaders. And we pray that you would be with them, that you would protect them, that you would arm them every day. And would you use all the things that you've taught them as they share with others to raise up global leaders around the world. And we pray for their last few weeks as they're here in North America. We pray for their travel and we pray for success in their ministry. And we pray for us, Lord, that we would be men and women who are aware of our enemy and the strategies and that we would be willing every morning when we get up to have what we need, to be able to arm ourselves, and to be able to put Christ on and to be able to stand in victory in him in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Mike and Marianne. We're glad that you are here. And I invite us to stand, and we're just going to sing about the victory of Christ, the power of Christ in us. <laughs>